and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Today's episode is the third part of a three-part episode on the Delhi Sultanate of Northern India in the Middle Ages. If you are new to the series, you might want to skip back a couple episodes and catch Crossroads of Civilizations Part 1 and 2, but provided you are okay with starting Episode 3, let us continue. Now, at the end of Part 2, we discussed the reign of a particularly colorful character in the mid-1300s. I am speaking of the Emperor Mohammed bin Tukluk. Right? Tukluk is the guy who tried dealing with a silver crisis by minting cheap copper coins that became worthless. He's the guy who tried relocating his capital almost a thousand miles to the south, and thousands of people died. And meanwhile, his main capital, Adeli, lost most of its population. Incompetent leader, volatile. We even closed with a lengthy quote from the Moroccan travelogue written by Ibn Battuta describing all kinds of aspects of life in Tukluk's court. But in all of this, we didn't discuss the military aspects of Tukluk's rule. And Tukluk did a lot of military stuff. He conquered a great deal of land. The Delhi Sultanate has traditionally been a northern Indian power, right? Centered around well, the city of Delhi in north-central India and then the Indus Valley region to the west and sometimes the Ganges Delta region to the east. But Tukluk pushes south. He pushes way south, almost to the southern end of India. He invades one Hindu kingdom after another, after another, after another. And as you might imagine, this is expensive. But as long as he keeps winning, he can fund his wars with loot. Conquer a kingdom, take all the goods, pay your army, hold on to the excess, invade another kingdom, rinse, lather, repeat. And... But Tukluk doesn't just fund his wars with victory. He also funds his wars by raising taxes. And by raising them sometimes by 10 or 20 fold on the non-Muslim population. To avoid this completely untenable level of taxation, right again, in an era of people living much closer to the subsistence level than we do today, higher taxes can mean death. can mean not having enough food to survive winter. Well, in a European context, in an Indian context, not having enough food to survive the dry season. But either way, the result is just about the same. A lot of these overtaxed people these uh, Hindu folks in the countryside, well, they flee to the wilderness to live in secret, unable to survive on their farms. Starting in the 1320s, rebellions begin to break out. And they prove persistent, not just in Hindu-dominated southern and eastern provinces, but even in the West, in modern-day Pakistan, in Muslim populated lands where there are poor Turkic slaves who are also having trouble just getting by under Tukluk's economic system. So starting in the 1320s and then into the 1330s, Tukluk does not have so many victories. Instead of advancing on one kingdom after another, he's putting down one rebellion after another, which means he's basically fighting on his own ground, so no more loot. No more loot means a smaller army, means less ability to put down rebellions, and you can see how this situation can kind of form a vicious circle that could 
threatened to take down an empire. Well, in 1336, a pair of brothers, a pair of Hindu brothers, unite the remaining Hindu kingdoms south of the Deccan Plateau. And a lot of these kingdoms, which were at the very moment in rebellion against Muhammad bin Tukluk. And these brothers form what is at first a loose confederation and then gets tighter and tighter and tighter and soon becomes something called the Vijayanagara Empire. This is a Hindu super state that will preserve Hindu traditions in southern India for about the next 300 years. When we think of the modern Indian subcontinent being divided between Muslim-dominated Pakistan and Hindu-dominated India, well, this giant Hindu power is a big part of it, and Tukluk can't really do anything about it. At the very moment the Vijayanagara Empire is declared in 1336, he is in prison, and he is being held captive by the Rajputs of Mewar. This is a region way up in northwest India, the other end of the subcontinent. And in order to earn his release from prison, Tukluk must recognize Mewar's independence. So not only has he lost all of these freshly conquered Hindu kingdoms, he's also lost this uh, Mewar region, which the Delhi Sultanate has controlled for some time. And Mewar would, in fact, remain an independent kingdom all the way up until 1949, when it voluntarily joined the Republic of India. Well... With his south walled off by the Vijayanagara Empire, Tukluk continues to war in the north. But as I said, even many fellow Muslims at this point are just sick of his incompetence. I mean, this, this guy has taken a perfectly successful empire and managed to create an economic crisis and a migration crisis out of thin air. He's invaded a bunch of territories he couldn't hold, raised taxes to the limit. You can understand why well, a lot of people would just really rather somebody else is in charge. And in 1347, took looks governor on the Deccan Plateau, that is roughly the central part of India as you go from north to south, his governor there revolts and then immediately abdicates. And that governor's successor founds the Bahmani Sultanate. This is yet another rival kingdom to be carved out of Tukluk's empire in just a few short years. And the Bahmani Sultanate and the Vijayanagara Empire are large, organized states, right? These are not the small, petty kingdoms that the Delhi Sultanate has had to deal with as southern neighbors before. Right? Either one of these countries can field an army larger than any European state of the time. They have their own coinage, their own infrastructure. They are every bit the equal of the Delhi Sultan, and at the moment they're also better led. And along the same lines, the Rajputs of Mewar are fanatical and heavily armed and well fortified. Where can Tukluk now go to go to war? A Delhian conquest is effectively blocked off in all directions unless he wants to engage a major power he can't beat. Well, he doesn't have to worry about this for long because four years after the breakoff of the Bahmani Sultanate in 1351, Tukluk dies while on campaign against some of those Turkic slave rebels out in the West. And Tukluk is succeeded by his cousin, a man named Firuz Shah Tukluk, a 42-year-old noble who 
doesn't really want the job, who can blame him, and who, as a matter of fact, has to be talked into taking the job of sultan. When he takes over, Farouz Shah is actually a fairly competent ruler. He begins by reversing Tughluq's foreign policy. He is no longer to maintain a policy of aggression towards neighbors, and he even lets ongoing rebellions go unanswered. He focuses on domestic policy and infrastructure and rebuilding the economy in the hopes that some of those areas in rebellion will voluntarily return to the fold now that Mohammed bin Tukluk is gone. Farouz Shah spends a lot of money on founding new cities and investing in major irrigation and reservoir projects. Uh, perhaps his most famous project is the city of Firuzabad outside of Delhi. While Firuzabad has now almost entirely been either destroyed or absorbed by New Delhi, one of India's greatest monuments remains. The iconic Red Fort, which you can see to this day. Now, Farooz Shah does continue some of Mohammed bin Tukluk's policies. Uh, he funds most of his policies via the jizya, which is a tax on non-Muslims. And he sets up this tax not on land, but by putting tax collectors outside of Hindu temples and simply collecting taxes from the congregants as they go in. Turns out a pretty effective way of finding non-Muslims is at non-Muslim places of worship. And much of the labor for Farooz Shah's projects, much of this labor comes uh, in state-run factories that are staffed by thousands of slaves and that are located in some of these new cities. And Farooz Shah also takes some steps to endear the people to him beyond just basic infrastructure. He establishes a welfare program. It's called the Dewan e Kairat, and it is basically a state-run widows and orphans fund. Outside the Delhi Sultanate, Farooz Shah does engage in a little bit of conflict. He marches his army out against the northeastern kingdom of Orissa, and he plunders their capital. He doesn't conquer, but he takes a bunch of loot, and he makes the local leaders swear that they will not attack the Delhi Sultanate and that they will pay tribute. And... The reason he did this is most likely that Orissa is a Hindu kingdom and Farooz Shah knew his kingdom was weak and to forestall any trouble attacked first. Other than that, he isn't too interested in military affairs. He is, however, a religious fundamentalist. He establishes formal Sharia law and he makes many changes in the Laws regarding day-to-day -day life. For instance, women are now forbidden from going out in public without being accompanied by a male relative. And the Shia and Sufi forms of Islam are banned altogether. Farooz Shah is a Sunni Muslim, and if you are a Shia or a Sufi, well, you can just get out of his sultanate. At the same time... Farooz Shah is a notoriously cultured man. He orders over 1,300 ancient Sanskrit manuscripts translated into Persian and Arabic. That is a huge treasure trove of ancient Indian culture that we now have today in large part because Farooz Shah had it translated and copied and brought forward into a new millennium. And all in all, he has a fairly peaceful and successful reign. There are few rebellions thanks to the prosperity that he brings to the Delhi Sultanate. And 
In 1387, after 36 years of rule and failing health, Farouz Shah abdicates at the age of 78 and he leaves the kingdom to his grandson, Tughluq Khan. A year later, Farouz Shah dies and almost immediately a succession crisis breaks out and a series of rebellions and just plain bad luck leads to a series of short sultanates. Tughluq Khan would be overthrown in 1389 by Abu Bakr Shah, who would be overthrown in 1390 by Muhammad Shah, who would die in 1394 and be succeeded by his son Alauddin Sikandar Shah. And Alauddin Sikandar Shah would reign for all of a month before being succeeded in March of 1394 by the last sultan of the Tughluq dynasty. And that is Nasiruddin Muhammad Shah. Nasiruddin Muhammad Shah would spend the first three years of his reign putting down a rebellion from a rival claimant. And throughout all of this, the Delhi Sultanate loses several eastern and western provinces, right? This whole 10-year period of multiple sultans and multiple rebellions and no continuity and no sustained policy of any time, the Sultanate largely falls apart. And this is very unfortunate timing because during this same period, a neighboring power is rising. This is a Central Asian power called the Timurid Empire. And the Timurid Empire is a new power. It's based in the lands of Transoxiana, modern-day Uzbekistan, roughly, with its capital in the ancient city of Samarkand. This area had been conquered a century before, give or take, by the Chagatai Khanate, some of the followers of Genghis Khan. And the area is still populated and largely ruled by the descendants of these Chagatai Khans. The leader of the Timurid Empire, Timur Gurkhani, after whom it is named, Timur Gurkhani was born in 1336, even while Mohammed bin Tukluk was sitting in a Rajput jail watching the Vijayanagara Empire split off. Now, as a young man, this Timur Gurkhani is little more than a bandit leader. From what we can tell, he isn't rich, he isn't terribly powerful, and he has some runs of bad luck. During a cattle raid, he is shot in the leg and the hand. He loses two fingers and he develops a limp, and it is from this incident that he gets his nickname, Timur the Lame which is why Europeans and European historians usually just call him Tamerlane. A descendant of Genghis Khan's great-great-grandfather, Tamerlane manages to find work with a local Khan leader, one of these descendants of the Chagatai Khans who's still warring in the area, and Tamerlane is a good choice. Number one, he seems to be a competent leader, but he is also half Turkish and a Muslim. Right? The Chagatai Khans are ethnic Mongols, so having a leader who is half Mongol and half local, so to speak, well, that's beneficial for this local Khan leader to... to bring Tamerlane on as a military leader. And Tamerlane becomes a major success for this Khan, a man by the name of Kaza Khan, and he rises up within Kaza Khan's army. So much so that when Kaza Khan dies and the local Chagatai claimants are all squabbling over who should take over his kingdom... It is Tamerlane who is sent outside of the kingdom to negotiate with 
a foreign Khan who is threatening to invade. It is thought that Tamerlane not only has the kingdom's interests at heart, but also has the panache to do this negotiation. But Tamerlane is sick of waiting for the Chagatai Khans to make up their minds about leadership, so instead he ends up siding with the outside Khan who is threatening to invade, a man named Tukluk Timur. And Tamerlane helps Tukluk Timur to subdue the region of Transoxiana, and when he does, he is rewarded with the local governorship. Later on, Tukluk Timur changes his mind. He tries to appoint his own son as governor instead, and Tamerlane, against great odds, defeats him in battle and maintains command of a now de facto independent kingdom. Shortly thereafter, in 1370, Tamerlane has his own brother assassinated. His brother had been the governor in Afghanistan, and with him dead... Tamerlane is now the ruler of both Transoxiana and Afghanistan, which makes him the de facto ruler of the entire Chagatai Khanate. And now he's going to expand his empire further. Most of what he does is way outside the scope of today's episode, right? We're talking about the Delhi Sultanate here, and Tamerlane is off conquering all of Persia plus Albania plus the region of Khwarizm to the north of Transoxiana, and he even raids as far away as Ryazan. That is a city that's only 120 miles from Moscow. That's a long way from Afghanistan. In addition to all of that, Tamerlane actually wins a major defeat against the Knights Hospitaller, some crusading knights, at Smyrna, all the way in western Anatolia, while he's taking a break from fighting the Ottomans. He kind of likes to fight everybody. But Tamerlane does style himself the Sword of Islam, and he likes to couch his wars in religious terms, even when they're against other Muslims. So much so that the King of Castile, a Spanish kingdom, He even suggests to the Pope the idea of launching a crusade against Tamerlane, but Tamerlane is also fighting against the Ottomans, who are threatening European interests at the time, so the Pope demurs. As a matter of fact, Tamerlane and Charles VI of France even have some correspondence that has survived to this day. They talk about trade and... They seem to have good relations. So Tamerlane is a complicated guy. And we don't have to paraphrase anything about his invasion of India. Although, we may have to take some things with a grain of salt. See, we can read about Tamerlane's invasion of India in his own words because he wrote an autobiography. So many ancient figures, or in this case medieval figures, we hear about them from people a generation or two later, but we don't have to do that with Tamerlane. He told us. He's like Winston Churchill writing his biography after World War II, making sure that history hears his version of events. Here is how Tamerlane himself describes his Indian invasion. He says, quote, About the year 800 A.H., that's 1398 A.D., there arose in my heart the desire to lead an expedition against the infidels and to become a champion of the faith, for it had reached my ears that the slayer of infidels is a champion and that if he is slain he becomes a martyr. It was for this reason that I formed my resolution, but I was undetermined in my mind whether I should direct my expedition against the infidels of China or against the infidels and polytheists of India. In this matter, I sought an omen from the Koran, and the verse to which I opened was this, O prophet, make war upon infidels and unbelievers, 
and treat them with severity. My chief officers told me that the inhabitants of Hindustan were infidels and unbelievers. In obedience to the mandate of Almighty God, I determined to make an expedition against them and I issued an order to the emirs of mature years and to the leaders in war to assemble in my presence. And when they had come together, I questioned the assembly as to whether I should invade Hindustan or China, and said to them, By the command of God and of his prophet, I needs must make war upon these infidels and polytheists. Throwing themselves upon their knees, they all wished me good fortune. I then asked the warrior chieftains whether I should direct my expedition against the infidels of Hindustan or of China. At first, they repeated fables and wise sayings, and then said that in the country of Hindustan there are four defenses, and if anyone invades this extensive country and breaks down these four defenses, he becomes the conqueror of the land. The first defense consists of five large rivers, which flow from the mountains of Kashmir, after which they unite in their course, pass through the country of Sindh, and flow into the Arabian Sea. Nor is it possible to cross them without boats and bridges. The second defense consists of woods and forests and trees, which, interweaving stem with stem and branch with branch, render it extremely difficult to penetrate into the country. The third defense is the soldiery and landholders and princes and rajas of that country who inhabit fastnesses in those forests and dwell there like wild beasts. The fourth defense consists of the elephants, for in the day of battle the rulers of that country equip the elephants in mail, put them in the van of their army, and place great confidence in them, and they have trained them to such a degree that with their trunks they lift a horse with his soldier and... Whirling him in the air, they dash him to the ground. Unquote. Now, the entire account of Tamerlane's invasion of India is very long. Suffice it to say that he conquers all of those Hindu kingdoms and rebellious Turkic kingdoms in the north and west. But when he comes to the Delhi Sultanate itself, how can he possibly justify an invasion on the grounds of a holy war? After all, the Delhi Sultanate is a Muslim state. Well, Tamerlane simply says that there are some Hindu governors that have too much power. And that is his excuse for invading Delhi. Now, let's skip ahead a little bit to when he's done mopping up in this Hindu territory and he's approaching Delhi proper. Tamerlane says, quote, At this court, Amir Jahan Shah, Amir Suleiman Shah, and other Amirs of experience informed me that from the time of entering Hindustan up to the present, we had taken more than 100,000 infidels and Hindus prisoners, and that they were all in my camp. On the previous day, when the enemy's forces attacked us, the prisoners made signs of rejoicing, uttered imprecations against us, and were ready, as soon as they heard of the enemy's success, to form themselves into a body, break their bonds, plunder our tents, and then to join the enemy and so increase his numbers and strength. I asked the emirs for advice about the prisoners, and they said that on the day of battle these 100,000 prisoners could not be left with the baggage and that it would be entirely opposed to the rules of war to set these idolaters and foes of Islam at liberty, so that no course remained but to make them all food for the sword. When I heard these words, I found them to be in accordance with the rules of war, and I immediately directed the commanders to proclaim throughout the camp that every man who had infidel prisoners was to put them to death, and that whoever neglected to do so should himself be executed and his property given to the informer. When this order became known to the champions of Islam, they drew their swords and put their prisoners to the death. One hundred thousand infidels, impious idolaters, were slain on that day. Molina Nasir ad-Din Omar, a counselor and man of learning who had never killed a sparrow in all his life, now in execution of my order, killed fifteen idolatrous Hindus who were his captives. Unquote. 
100,000 captives slaughtered in an afternoon. If you listened to the episodes on the Crusades, you'll remember a couple of incidents where Richard the Lionheart and Saladin each kills just a few thousand prisoners. And in both of these cases, the massacre becomes food for propaganda on the other side and is considered scandalous. Well, when you go from the Mediterranean world to India, the numbers of people involved go up so much that the 2,700 Muslim prisoners killed by Richard the Lionheart in one incident. Well, that's a rounding error on Tamerlane's number of 100,000. And this is not an aberration for Tamerlane. In his time, he would kill or be responsible for the deaths of about 17 million people, which is about 5% of the human population at the dawn of the 1400s. Continuing with the account of this complicated mass murderer, Tamerlane says, quote, After all the vile idolaters had been dispatched, I gave orders that one man out of every ten should be told off to guard the property, cattle, and horses which had been captured in the invasion, while all the other soldiers were to march with me. At the time of midday prayer, the signal was given for the march, and I proceeded to the spot selected for crossing the Jumna, and there encamped. The astrologers who accompanied the army consulted their books and almanacs as to the time propitious for battle, and they represented that the aspects of the stars made a short delay advisable. In all matters, small and great, I placed my reliance on the favor and kindness of God, and I knew that victory and conquest, defeat and flight, are each ordained by Him, so that I gave no credence to the words of the astrologers and stargazers, but besought the giver of victory to favor my arms. I did not wish the war to be of long continuance, so as soon as night was over and morning came, I arose to my devotions. I said the morning prayers in the congregation, and repeated my private prayers, after which I took the Koran, opened it at random, and placed my finger at a venture on a verse in the chapter of the bee, which I received as a propitious indication, and acted in full reliance on its command and on the favor of God. On the 5th of Rabi al December 15th, I passed the Jumna by a ford and pitched my tents on the other side of the river, after which I gave orders to the emirs and other officers to station their men as near my tent as possible, and also directed that the ground around the camp should be parceled out among them, and that each one should have a deep ditch dug in front of his allotment. All the soldiers, great and small, assembled to dig the ditch, which was constructed around the entire camp in two watches of the day. I then rode out to inspect it, and ordered that the trees in the vicinity should be cut down and brought within the ditch, that their branches should be formed into a strong abatis, and that in some places planks should be set up. It had been constantly dinned into the ears of my soldiers that the chief reliance of the armies of Hindustan was on their mighty elephants, which, completely encased in armor, marched into battle in front of their forces, that arrows and swords were of no use against them, that in height and bulk they were like small mountains, while their strength was such that at a given signal they could tear up great trees and knock down strongly built walls, and that in the battlefield they could take up the horse and his rider with their trunks and hurl them into the air. Some of the soldiers, with the timidity natural to man, brought some little of what they had heard to my attention, so that when I assigned their respective positions to the princes and emirs of the right and left wing and of the center, I made special inquiry of the holy and learned men who accompanied my army where they would like to be placed in the day of battle. They had been with me in many campaigns, and had witnessed many a great battle, but the stories about the elephants of India had so affected them that they instantly replied that they would like to be placed with the ladies while the battle was in progress. To allay the apprehensions of this class of men, 
I gave orders that all the buffaloes which had been taken and placed with the baggage should be brought up. I then had their heads and necks fastened to their legs and put them inside the abatis. I gave orders for the camp to be carefully guarded all night to prevent a surprise by the enemy. And the night was passed with the caution and care which are necessary in war. When the morn of victory dawned, I said my prayers in the congregation, and after I had discharged that duty, I gave directions for the drums and other musical instruments to be sounded. The princes and emirs armed themselves completely, and marched with their respective forces in regular order, while I mounted my horse and rode forth to marshal my array. When I had arranged my right and left wings, I placed the right wing under the command of Prince Pir Muhammad Jahangir, Amir Yadgar Berlas, and some other high officers. The left wing I put under the command of Prince Sultan Hussein, Prince Khalil Sultan, Amir Jahan Shah, and their colleagues. And the advance guard I placed under such generals as Prince Rustam and Amir Shaki Nur ad I took my own place with the center. When all the forces were arrayed, I ordered the vanguard to go forward and obtain some knowledge of the enemy. One of the advance guard captured a man belonging to the enemy's van and brought him into me. When I asked this prisoner about the position of the enemy, he told me that Sultan Mahmud had drawn up his army with the intention of fighting. His right wing was commanded by Muin din Malik Hadi, and other officers. His left wing was under Taghi Khan, Mir Ali, and others, and that the Sultan had taken up his own position with the center, and had appointed a body of troops to act as rearguard. His whole force amounted to 10,000 veteran horse and 40,000 warlike infantry in addition to 125 elephants covered with armor, most of them carrying howdahs in which were men to hurl grenades, fireworks, and rockets. Thus they came up to battle. The enemy's forces now made their appearance, and I accordingly rode to the top of a little hill which was hard by, where I carefully scrutinized their array and said to myself that, with the favor of God, I would defeat them and gain a victory. I alighted from my horse on the top of that hill and performed my devotions, bowing my head to the ground and beseeching the Almighty for victory. As I did this, I perceived signs that my prayers were heard, so that, when I had finished, I mounted my horse in the full assurance of God's assistance. I returned to the center and took up my position under the imperial standard, after which I directed Ali Sultan Tawachi, Altun Bakshi, and other leaders to march with their regiments to strengthen the right wing, also commanding the remaining officers to proceed with their men to the support of the vanguard. It so happened that Amir Yadgar Burlas and Suleiman Shah, who were with the right wing, and Amir Sheikh Nur ad and Amir Shah Malik, who were with the vanguard, had conceived this very idea at the same instant and had remarked to each other that they would look upon any reinforcement received from the center as a presage of victory. It was just then that the Almighty put it into my mind to send them assistance. The two armies now confronted each other. The drums were beaten on both sides. Shouts and cries were raised. The ground trembled, and a great noise was heard. At this instant, Sunjak Bahadur, Sayyid Kauja, Allah Dad, and others separated from the vanguard, and when they perceived that Sultan Mahmud's forces were approaching, they moved off to the right, and getting secretly behind the enemy's advance guard as it came on unsuspecting, they rushed from their ambush, and falling upon the foe in the rear, sword in hand, they scattered them as hungry lions scatter a flock of sheep, and killed six hundred of them in this single charge. Prince Pir Muhammad Jahangir, who commanded the right wing, moved his own forces forward, and with Amir Suleiman Shah and his regiments of brave cavalry attacked the left wing of the enemy, which was commanded by Taghi Khan, and poured a shower of arrows upon it so that my brave fighters, pressing like furious elephants upon this part of the enemy's host, compelled it to take refuge in flight. The left wing of my army, under Prince Sultan Hussein, Amir Jahan Shah, Amir Giyas ad din and other emirs, bravely attacked the enemy's right wing, which was commanded by Malik Muad-Din and Malik Hadi. 
They so pressed it with the trenchant sword and piercing arrows that they compelled the enemy to break and fly. Jahan Shah pursued them and attacked them again and again until they reached the gates of the city of Delhi. Simultaneously, Sultan Mahmud, with Malu Khan and the army of the center, with its officers and soldiers more numerous than ants or locusts, and with its strong war elephants, made an attack upon my center, where Prince Rustam, Amir Sheikh Nur ad-Din, and their colleagues met it with a brave and resolute resistance. While they were thus engaged, Dalat Timur Tawachi, Mangali Kawaja, and other emirs came up with their respective forces and assailed the enemy. I now gave the order to a party of brave fellows who were in attendance with me, and they cut their way to the sides of the emirs who were fighting in the forefront of the battle. They brought the elephant drivers to the ground with their arrows and killed them, after which they attacked and wounded the elephants with their swords. The soldiers of Sultan Mahmud and Malu Khan showed no lack of courage and bore themselves manfully in the fight, but they could not withstand the successive onslaughts of my soldiers. Seeing their own plight and that of the soldiers and elephants around them, their courage fell and they took to flight. Sultan Mahmud and Malin Khan reached the city with a thousand difficulties and shut themselves up close in the fortifications. The whole of Sultan Mahmud's army was defeated. Part was slain and part had found refuge in the fort towards which I marched, exalted with victory. When I reached its gates... I carefully reconnoitered its towers and walls, and then returned to the side of the Hausi Kas, a reservoir constructed by Sultan Feroz Shah, and faced all around with stone and cement. Each side of this reservoir is more than a bowshot long, and buildings are placed around it. It is filled by the rains and the rainy season, and supplies the people of the city with water throughout the year. The tomb of Sultan Feroz Shah stands on its bank. When I had pitched my camp here, the princes and emirs and all the generals and officers came to pay their respects and to offer me their congratulations on this great victory. I embraced them all and praised them for the exertions and courage which I myself had seen. When I recounted the favors and mercies I had received from the Almighty, my excellent sons, the brave and renowned emirs who served under me, and the great and glorious victories I had achieved, my heart melted and tears fell from my eyes. I cast myself upon the ground and poured forth my thanksgivings to the All-Beneficent. All who were present raised their voices in prayer and expressed their earnest wishes for the continuance of my prosperity and the prolongation of my reign. Unquote. And without any serious defenses, the city of Delhi falls shortly thereafter. Now, for the first few days, the sack of that city is relatively civilized. Relatively few people are killed. It is mostly a sacking of property. Tamerlane's troops are stealing money and supplies and wealth that they can take back with them. But after a few days, looting and rioting break out. And in the ensuing crackdown, as many as one million Indians are killed. The city of Delhi will take a century to recover. Before leaving Delhi, Tamerlane appoints a man named Kaiser Khan, a former Delhian rebel leader, as his viceroy, his personal representative. Nasiruddin Muhammad Shah technically remains sultan until his death in February 1413, but his position is meaningless, Kaiser Khan is effectively the ruler of the Delhi Sultanate. And upon Nasiruddin Muhammad Shah's death, a brief civil war breaks out and Kaiser Khan, that viceroy, takes over as the new sultan. Now here's the odd part. Tamerlane, in the meantime, had died in 1405, eight years earlier, and 
Much like Alexander the Great, he left his empire divided, and it had fallen apart with various successor generals and presumptive heirs fighting for their piece of the pie. So Kaiser Khan was now the sultan of a Delhi sultanate that was once again independent. And he is the founder of the shortest dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate, the Sayyid dynasty. Right, he reigns until 1421, and he is succeeded by his son Mubarak Shah. And Mubarak Shah reigns until 1434, where very little of importance happens during this time. And when Mubarak Shah dies, he is succeeded by his nephew, Muhammad Shah, who would reign until 1445 and leave the throne to his son, Alam Shah. So, a series of relatively unimportant sultans of a relatively shrunken sultanate. Now, in Alam Shah's time, during his reign, there is a Pashtun warlord, a warlord from southern Afghanistan, named Balu Lodi. He already controls a large part of the Punjab region in northwest India, and as a matter of fact, he'd already attacked Delhi in 1443 during Muhammad Shah's reign and been repulsed. He tries again two years into Alam Shah's reign in 1447, and he's again pushed back. But Alam Shah is either just not happy being sultan or so upset by this attack that he up and retires. And this leaves the Delhi Sultanate in a pickle because the sultan has just retired and not even appointed an heir, so... In 1448, Alam Shah's chief minister invites Balu Lodi, this Pashtun warlord, to come in and take over the position of sultan. And Balu accepts. And in 1448, after twice trying to take Delhi by force, he simply walks in, is crowned sultan, and founds the Lodi dynasty which will be the last dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate. But this last dynasty begins well. Balu Lodi is already a successful guy. Right? He already controls the Punjab region, so when he takes over the Delhi Sultanate, the Sultanate automatically, like immediately more than doubles in size. And... Balu Lodi continues conquering. He conquers much of northern India. Most notably, he annexes the Jaunpur region in the northeast. This area has been independent for decades at this point, and now the Delhi Sultanate gets it back. Bilal's son, Sikandar Lodi, he takes over in 1489. He reasserts control over more parts of the Punjab region, and by the time of his death in 1517, the Delhi Sultanate has more or less had its territory restored basically to where it was at the beginning of our episode, minus the breakaway Bahmani Sultanate on the Deccan Plateau. But it really has recovered and controls most of northern India and what is now Pakistan. And Sikandar Lodi helps to further cement this control by doing what so many successful Delhi sultans have done. He focuses on infrastructure, he builds roads, he creates several important irrigation projects, but... He is also very religious and very strict and demolishes many Hindu temples. He is often compared to Farooz Shah, who we talked about just a little bit earlier. Even so, while he may be a religious bigot, Sikandar Lodi is a great administrator who brings prosperity back to India. His son... Ibrahim Lodi, who takes over in 1517, well, 
Suffice it to say that he will be the last of the Delhi sultans. Now, we don't know a ton about his youth, but we know that even when he takes power, he is already disliked by much of the nobility. And right off the bat, Ibrahim faces several revolts. And after this, instead of focusing on administration and proving himself to his nobles, he launches what would best be described as a Stalinesque purge of the leadership, both civilian and military. Particularly in the military, though, all of his experienced advisors and generals are replaced with young, sometimes very young loyalists, and most of these senior figures are just executed outright. And those who aren't executed... Well, Ibrahim manages to alienate many of them, most notably a man named Daulat Khan Lodai, the governor of Punjab, this area in the northwest, and another man named Alauddin, who is actually Ibrahim's own uncle. Well, both of these men, Governor Daulat and Alauddin, both of them in 1524 send invitations to a neighboring warlord to come and invade the Delhi Sultanate. And this warlord is a man named Zahiruddin Muhammad, but historians now refer to him usually by his Persian name, Baber. Baber means the tiger. He is also oftentimes just called Mughal from the Arabic word for Mongol. Baber will be the last major character in this drama. Baber is a great-great-grandson of Tamerlane, that great Turkic-Mongol warlord who had invaded the Delhi Sultanate about a century ago. And he grows up as a military leader in modern-day Uzbekistan, his family homeland. In 1496, he conquers Samarkand, but in the process, while his army is away, he loses his home region of Fargana in the process. That's an area a little further east towards China, where Baber is from. Well, he loses that homeland, so... He shortly thereafter marches out of Samarkand to go back and take Fergana over, and he retakes his homeland, but what do you know? While well, he's gone, someone else comes and takes over Samarkand. And eventually he flees, he takes over Kabul, he goes conquering again. He has this fascinating resume of just marching around Central Asia conquering and losing the same cities over and over again. And eventually he loses everything but Kabul and the surrounding area in Afghanistan, which is right across the Khyber Pass from the Delhi Sultanate. So when Baber receives this invitation, right, this letter from Daulat Khan Lodai and Alauddin, well, that's all he needs to come into the Delhi Sultanate. He's already raided there before in 1519. So this invitation in 1524 is extremely welcome, and Babur enters immediately. He crosses over the Himalayas, and since the Punjab governor invited him, he is able to walk in without meeting any resistance, and... With him, he does not just bring men and horses. He brings something new. He brings field artillery. Now, siege artillery has been around for a little while by this point. When people are defending a city, they expect to see a cannon or ten. But... The artillery of the time have, up till now, usually not been very mobile. It takes days to set up one of these very ancient siege cannons. 
what Baber is bringing with him are smaller cannons that can be moved around on wheels. They are something you can bring to a fight out in the field. But he doesn't have to use them right away. As it turns out, he can take the Punjabi capital of Lahore without a fight. Once again, because the governor has simply told his men to stand by. At that point, Babur stations a garrison in the city of Lahore. And with the rest of his men, he returns to Kabul for the winter. By this point in his career, he has learned not to leave his homeland unoccupied for too long because somebody might come take it from him. Well, during the winter of 1524-1525, the governor of Punjab, uh, Dalat Khan, he has a change of heart. And he assembles an army to expel Baber's garrison. Sultan Ibrahim's uncle Alauddin learns of this, and he goes and he warns Baber of Dalaut Khan's plot. But then Alauddin also has a change of heart, and he goes and tells Dalaut Khan that he told Baber that Dalaut Khan was preparing an army, so this is now a triple cross, but it really doesn't matter anyway. Baber's spies get wind of this. Uh, he doesn't even come into the Delhi Sultanate at all in 1525, and it appears that Dalat Khan lets the garrison stay in Lahore for now while waiting for a larger army to show up, so nothing happens until January of 1526. At this point, after more than a year of inactivity, he crosses into the Delhi Sultanate again to relieve his garrison. And he knows that he needs to deal with Dalat Khan's army immediately. He is outnumbered. He only has about 10,000 men, and Dalat Khan has roughly 40,000. But Baber launches a blitz attack, and Dalat Khan himself flees, and at that, his army of 40,000 disperses. Well, Alauddin, this triple-crossing uncle of Sultan Ibrahim, well, he gets down on his hands and knees and begs Baber for mercy. And Baber wisely forgives him, but holds him close as an advisor. He is keeping his enemies close, so to speak. With so few men... Baber is still outnumbered, right? He's attacking a major military power with an army of 10,000 and some artillery. With the addition of around 5,000 allied locals, he raises his numbers to about 15,000 and marches towards Delhi, towards north-central India, and he hugs close to the Himalayan foothill kind of tracks almost north of the city because he doesn't want to get surrounded. He wants to keep his back to the mountains, at least as long as possible. When he gets directly north of Delhi, near the town of Panipat, it's around 90 miles north of Delhi, he sets up a defensive position. He is expecting that Sultan Ibrahim will attack and uh, he uses the town to anchor his right flank and uses a ravine to secure his left flank. And then he has some trees cut down to further fortify the ravine and commandeers 700 wagons from locals in the area and ties them together as a sort of makeshift bulwark. But he leaves gaps in this line of wagons so his troops can either charge out or retreat back through the wagons freely. His men are armed with a combination of bows and matchlock muskets. These are early muskets where the soldiers actually carry a burning taper. It's 
sort of like a really long wick. And then to fire the musket, you actually have to light a you know, smaller fuse in the musket. It's fairly awkward and a bit dangerous and more complicated than like a revolutionary war musket. But this is something, again, that the folks in the Delhi Sultanate haven't even seen before. Right? The shock value of this weapon is not to be understated. It doesn't really matter if you don't kill a whole lot of the enemy, if they all just run away like they did at the last battle, right? Sultan Ibrahim does indeed march out to meet Baber. And he arrives near the town of Panipat on April 12, 1426, with around 40,000 men, right? about the same number of men that Dalat Khan had had. And it is augmented by several hundred elephants. Right? So Baber's got his artillery and his matchlock muskets, and Sultan Ibrahim has his elephants. He is aware of Baber's artillery and the muskets, and he knows the shock value of these weapons. He does not want to attack. If Baber attacks him, he's not going to be able to make full use of his artillery and his muskets. Ibrahim may just stand a chance against that. And Baber knows this too, right? He is badly outnumbered. It would be a dumb move for him to attack. He needs to fight defensively and use his artillery. But if Ibrahim won't attack him, he can't actually fight the battle he needs to fight to get rid of this army that's between him and the city of Delhi. So the two sides face off for about a week in a stalemate. And Baber then tries to do something a bit audacious. He orders 5,000 of his men to make a night march against Ibrahim's camp, try and catch the enemy unawares. But the men get lost in the dark, and on the morning of April 20th, as dawn breaks, they find themselves right in front of Ibrahim's main camp, with defenders starting to sally out to fight them off. Now, Ibrahim does not send his whole army after them, right? His guys are just sort of getting up in the morning and see enemy troops there and start going to chase them away. But when Baber's 5,000 retreat with relatively little pressure against them, Ibrahim decides that maybe he should attack. Maybe this Mughal force, this Mongol Turkic force, isn't all it's cracked up to be. And if he's got 40,000 guys, he can chase them right back across the Himalayas where they came from. So on the morning of April 21st, Ibrahim launches his attack. His standard army formation, should really say the standard army formation in the Delhi Sultanate playbook, it involves three large bodies of troops marching side by side. Tamerlane described this, right? He talks about the fight on the left and the right and the center and how the three different divisions are commanded by different groups. But Ibrahim wants to attack the Mongol left and try and flank them. And rather than try and move his men through the town right, where the Mughal left is anchored, right, where they're going to become disordered and there are going to be civilian casualties and stuff, he decides to make a frontal assault against the Mughal left. So what he does is instead of marching his army in three large blocks of men side by side, he marches the three blocks of men in a long column. Right, this will not only allow them to focus their attack on the Mughal left flank, but it will also reduce their exposure to enemy fire. The shorter your front is, 
the less area you have exposed to musket fire and cannon fire. Well, after the very first artillery volley, things start to go badly. The Delian elephants fall back in fear, and they're not a factor in the rest of the battle. They can't even be brought to bear. Meanwhile, Ibrahim's army has made it into attacking range, and they begin to form up opposite the Mughals. But the front rakes hesitate. They don't know if they're supposed to charge right in or if they're supposed to wait for the other divisions, the other blocks of troops to come in alongside them and form up in this three abreast type formation. So as the rear ranks start to charge in, the front ranks are trying to stand still and hold a line and the entire Delian force starts to get compacted. And it is here that Baber will now attempt the greatest challenge in all of military strategy, encircling a larger force with a smaller force. Here's what happened next, and the account is taken from Paul K. Davis's book, 100 Decisive Battles from Ancient Times to the Present. Davis writes, quote, In that moment, Baber struck. His forces were deployed in a mirror image of Ibrahim's, with minor differences. Baber's center formation was subdivided into right and left halves, and he had small flanking cavalry units as well. He also held a cavalry reserve. All this was arrayed behind his wagon line. When Ibrahim's attack hesitated before the right flank, Baber dispatched his right center to support and then ordered his flanking units to ride around the enemy flanks and strike their rear, which was the stratagem he had planned from the beginning. As the troops on Ibrahim's left pressed forward into the hesitating front lines, the press became too great for any movement. It also became a huge target for all the Mughal firepower, both gunpowder and arrows. Sensing a growing panic in the attackers, Baber ordered his left center to advance through the gaps in his wagon line. Pressed from three sides, Ibrahim's army could do little more than stand and die. By noon, they were doing all they could to break free from the mass and escape, leaving behind 15,000 and 20,000 dead, including Ibrahim. Unquote. And after his unqualified success at the Battle of Panipat, Baber advances to Delhi unopposed. And there, he has himself crowned and declares the new Mughal dynasty. And this marks the end of the Delhi Sultanate and the beginning of a new Mughal empire. An empire forged by the power of gunpowder. After his coronation, many of Baber's troops beg to return to Afghanistan, but he decides to stay and solidify his rule in India, and in fact, he never again returns north of the Himalayas. During his lifetime, Baber's Mughal Empire would grow to encompass all of northern and eastern India. By 1700 at its height, it would rule all but the southern tip of the subcontinent, including most of the Vajianigari Empire, which we talked about at the beginning of this episode. The Mughal Empire would falter during the 18th and 19th centuries, falling first to Hindu and Sikh revolts and eventually to European colonists. It would end altogether in 1857 with a coalition of British and regional troops defeating the last Mughal emperor and establishing the British Raj. The British Raj would rule the subcontinent until 1947 when the modern nations of India and Pakistan were founded. But the boundaries between those nations were drawn on ancient lines. The lines between Muslim and Hindu. 
and British rule? Well, that was just the last in a long line of foreign dynasties, if you will, to rule the subcontinent. Before the British were the Mughals, and before them were the Turkish and Afghan dynasties of the Delhi Sultanate who brought Islam to the continent and ruled over the crossroads of civilization. And that's why it's relevant. Hello again, it's Dan, and I'm here to let you know about a few things we are doing to grow the show here at Relevant History. First off, there is now a monthly video series called Dan's War College. In that series, I, myself, do a video presentation on a particular battle from history and break down the tactics and the strategy involved. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, that is available at the Relevant History Patreon page, and that video, along with access to a private Discord server and, of course, a shout-out on the show, well, that can all be had for the low, low price of $5 a month. But if that's not enough, I'm also doing a monthly audio series called Irrelevant History, where we discuss silly or quirky events from history. That show, along with... A couple of other shows from other people, well, those are all available on the Salad Tossers Patreon channel, and that is only $1 a month. And just like the Relevant History Patreon channel, you can find the link for that in the description. And of course, if you'd like to hear more episodes, they're available on every major podcast service, most of the minor ones, and at dantollerpodcast.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R podcast.com. Don't forget to share the show with your friends and leave reviews on your favorite service. Every little bit helps, and if you'd like to get in touch, you can find the show on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast, that's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast, or on Facebook at Dan Toller, T-O-L-E-R. Finally, you can email me directly at Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast at gmail.com. Hope to hear from you soon.